The story of the giant rat begins with two other creatures. A century ago, phosphate was mined here for fertilizer. It was found in the guano of birds and bats. And guano was found in caves. In 1868, a Philadelphia manufacturer named Henry Waters received a shipment of phosphate from Anguilla. Amid the guano, Waters found unexpected cargo, fossils. Paleontologist Edward Drinker Cope was astounded. The bones were the remains of a rat, a 300-pound rat. Cope eventually received a hoard of bones from Anguilla. Yet he never figured out how such a large creature thrived on such a small island, or why it finally disappeared. Minutes after blasting through rock, the fossil hunters at last find what they've come for. Oh! Oh my god! What is Head it? of a femur. Huh. Get down. Wow. And a large one, too. And this looks like it might be another piece. It's fresh from fresh the room. Where was it? Right it came out right, right here. Excellent. See, we really do find things. <laughs> and even Don can tell the difference between a goat and an amblorizer. <laughs> Under the rock lay the bones of the giant rat, Amblorisa. Dozens of fossils were found, except the most important. In the case of Amblorisa, the biggest single part we're missing is the skull. And since we only have skull bits, it's been very hard to try and piece together where Amblorisa belongs in regard to other rodents in its particular evolutionary group. Let's consider the position of Amblorisa within the group known as New World rodents. They include species like the capybara, chinchilla, guinea pig, and many others. But according to the fossil evidence, we think that the line that gave rise to Amblorisa separated at a very early point, maybe 30 million years ago, from the other rodents. Amblorisa resembled the capybara of South America. Weighing up to 100 pounds, it's the largest living rodent. Like it, Amblorisa probably had a squarish head, a flat nose, and no tail. But Amblorisa was three times bigger. The fossil hunters never found a large bone intact, yet McPhee was able to build a plaster model of the rat based on the bones of an extinct relative and on the fragments from Cope's collection and the cave. The most spectacular feature of this skeleton as it's now set out is the huge size of the skull, which you can see very easily, and then somewhat harder to see perhaps is the nature of the relationship in size between the forelimb and the hind limb. The hind limb is very massively built, implying that the animal used its hind limb to support its entire body weight. Amblorisa was not only heavy, but slow. With such large hindquarters and small forelimbs, it must have lived free of predators, else nature wouldn't have let it waddle down the path of evolution unlike its fleet-footed cousin. The fossils reveal other clues to the rat's life. The animal probably spent a good deal of the time in postures where the weight of the animal was directed right over the lower skeleton, and that the forelimb did not support the weight, but instead was used to pull down branches and vegetation toward the mouth so that the animal could feed. In the gardens of ancient Anguilla, Amblorisa may have been the only diner. Paleontologists have found no trace of other large mammals living alongside it. Nothing could stop Amblorisa from growing as big as it wished, except geography. An island of 34 square miles cannot support a race of 300 pound rats. There must have been more to the story, and more to the island. 
The inhabitants of Anguilla harvest the sea more than the land. What little grows on this Caribbean island couldn't support a huge plant eater. But 200,000 years ago, Anguilla looked like its neighbor, St. Martin. On such bounty, the giant rat Amaluriza thrived. Anguilla was not only greener, it was bigger, 12 times its size today. The world was gripped by an ice age, and the seas had fallen. Anguilla, St. Martin, and St. Bart's were one big island, Greater Anguilla. The thing that drives me is to try and understand why Amaluriza got to the West Indian Islands in the first place. There are two theories, and an advocate for each. Ross believes the rat walked across on a land bridge that later submerged as sea levels rose. Don thinks the rat drifted over on a natural raft. Don can seemingly very easily visualize uh, pregnant females grasping onto rafts, floating off into the sea, traveling thousands of kilometers under the hot tropical sun, pulling up on a beach, darting out and immediately having a successful life thereafter. I have a few problems with that. Ross would uh, take the view that uh, rafting is a rather unlikely event, which it, it certainly is, um, although I would argue that given enough time, unlikely events happen. Ross would prefer uh, a geological explanation in which there was some form of, of, of dry land or damp land in which the animals could have trotted over uh, without their, all of their, their friends from South America. And I think it's a matter of looking, probably more by geologists than paleontologists, but evidence of a land bridge to these islands from South America will one day be found. And then we'll forget about rafting. It'll become a piece of history. Natural raft or natural bridge, the rat somehow reached the island. There it thrived, until one day it spawned a second mystery by vanishing. Back in Pitchapple Hole, 